Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side one of For the Record program number 725, titled Leak This, Weeky Spooks and the World of Stig Larsson. This is being recorded on October 9th of the year 2010. Uh, let me begin, as always, by encouraging you most emphatically to use the SpitfireList.com website. I do long written descriptions of each program. There is frequently information in the description that I didn't have time to include in the original broadcast. This will certainly be one of those shows. So please, SpitfireList.com, a huge resource and essential at this point for an understanding of For the Record. Now, in For the Record number 724, titled Wiki of the Damned, we took a look at the cult that I believe is fundamental to understanding Julian Assange, the kingpin of the WikiLeaks network. WikiLeaks is a group of online hackers and leakers who have achieved quite a bit of publicity because they have leaked various, among other things, various national security documents that uh, have proved or could prove extremely damaging to and even fatal to U.S. military personnel and damaging to a number of interests ranging from the American military to the Obama administration. As we'll see, uh, much of WikiLeaks appears to be aimed at anything that is uh, – uh, democratic or that isn't ultra-reactionary. Their claims to the contrary notwithstanding. The available evidence suggests that WikiLeaks is an intelligence network of some kind. There may very well be more than one intelligence service involved in this. I also want to stress that I have, I, at this point, still more questions than answers about WikiLeaks, and one of the reasons for that is that the organization itself is extremely mysterious. They are anything but transparent about their funding, about who's involved. They write this off to the need to maintain secrecy, to guard themselves from various government agents. Well, certainly some of the things that they are doing is going to draw fire from governmental authorities, but what we're going to be examining here in the first part of the program are the observations of another online leaker, a fellow named John Young, who does the Cryptome.org leaking site. Now, John Young is himself uh, obviously quite circumspect about the possibility of government interference with things like this. He also has a pretty good balance because he's not overly paranoid, uh, overly paranoid. There's not an excessive degree of paranoia on his part. He's had governments deal with him, and so he has a pretty good perspective. John Young, again, is one of the founders of WikiLeaks. He is now one of its fiercest critics. And so for the first part of our discussion, we are going to exam we're going to access an interview with John Young, one of WikiLeaks' early founders and now one of its fiercest critics, and we're going to note what he has to say about this organization. For one thing, he notes its excessive secrecy and how it doesn't make sense. First of all, he seriously doubts that any of WikiLeaks' alleged devices for maintaining the security of people who leak documents to them. He says that's just pure stuff and nonsense. No such thing exists. Also, their less than transparent maneuvering around their funding. They are getting, as we looked at at the tail end of our broadcast in 724, program number 724, WikiLeaks is operating to an extent from the, in terms of obtaining funding under the auspices of the Wow Holland Foundation in Germany. Wow Holland was an iconic German hacker, and uh, the Wow Holland Foundation itself is expressing skepticism about how much money WikiLeaks is actually receiving. Also, John Young himself has noted uh, the behavior of WikiLeaks as behaving like an intelligence service and has noted some very interesting things about some of its founders. So, for the first part of our discussion, here is John Young. This is from an interview, actually, this, this first one interview is not with Wired Magazine, but this is a CNET.com interview with John Young, and it reads in part, John Young was one of WikiLeaks' early founders. Now, he's one of the organization's most prominent critics. Young, a 74-year-old architect who lives in Manhattan, publishes a document-leaking website called Cryptome.org that predates WikiLeaks by over a decade. He's drawn fire from Microsoft after posting leaked internal documents about police requests, 
irked the U.K. government for disclosing the names of possible spies and annoyed Homeland Security by disclosing a review of Democratic National Convention security measures. Cryptome's history of publicizing leaks, while not yielding to pressure to remove them, is what led Young to be invited to join WikiLeaks before its launch over three years ago. He also agreed to be the public face of the organization by listing his name on the domain name registration. Operating a website to post leaked documents isn't very expensive. Young estimates he spends a little over $100 a month for Cryptome's server space. So when other WikiLeaks founders started to talk about the need to raise $5 million and complained that an initial round of publicity had affected, quote, our delicate negotiations with the Open Society Institute and other funding bodies, unquote, Young says he resigned from the effort. By the way, uh, Open Society Institute is George Soros, and as we've looked at in past broadcasts, the available evidence suggests very strongly that George Soros is part of the underground Reich, what I call a Borman Jew. Uh, he got a start in business basically helping to confiscate Jewish property, quote, Aryanizing Jewish property for the Nazis during the Nazi occupation of Hungary in World War II, something he describes as the happiest days of his life. So I don't think that's much of a reach. Uh, but anyway, do note that they were initially angling to hook up with George Soros. Continuing, in the last few weeks, after the arrest of Army intelligence analyst Bradley Manning cast a brighter spotlight on WikiLeaks, Young has been trying to trace WikiLeaks money flows. On July 17th, WikiLeaks asked supporters for $200,000 to pay for Manning's attorneys, even though the co-founder Julian Assange said a few days earlier that the organization had already raised a million dollars. CNET caught up with Young at the next Hope Hacker Conference here last weekend, where he was attending the WikiLeaks keynote speech. Following is a transcript made from a recorded interview with Young, lightly edited for space. What you're doing sounds a lot like what Weeks at WikiLeaks is doing. No, Young. Only superficially, Declan, because, and we can talk more about this, I initially thought that was what they were going to be doing when I first agreed to participate. But it became clear right away that they were going to set up an operation with multiple people involved. So the first difference is that I don't run an operation. I don't have any people working on this. This is strictly, and I like the term myself, but other people hate it, it's strictly an amateur version. It's not like WikiLeaks and their grand goals. I've never had any desire to overturn governments, do any of these noble things they want to do, or jack up journalism. This was just a way to get certain kinds of documents out to the public. And so when they explained the amount of money they were going to try to raise, that was the basis for parting company with them. I thought it was going to be more like Cryptome, which is a collective of people contributing their time to it and not a centralized operation raising lots of money. Cryptome is not into that kind of thing. We parted company at that point. We're still not like WikiLeaks in that we don't do any promotional work for our activities. CNET. Who were the other WikiLeaks founders? Young. I'm not going to talk about those. I will say that Julian Assange was clearly there. I elected to conceal those names when I published these messages. By the way, later on, we're going to take a look at some emails that uh, John Young has made public in which uh, Julian Assange, although not naming names, describes the people who were the founders of the organization. It is more than a little interesting. Continuing, and I think it's basically a violation of Cryptome's policy to publish the names of people who do not want to be identified. CNET. You had a falling out with the other WikiLeaks founders? Young, yes, but it was over this. Someone said that the initial goal was $5 million. That caught my attention. One, because I think the type of stuff I was going to publish, you should never do it for the money. Only because that contaminates the credibility and it turns it into a business opportunity, whereas there's great treachery and lying going on. And it will contaminate WikiLeaks. It always does. In fact... That is the principal means by which noble endeavors are contaminated. The money trail. That's pretty obvious. I happen to think that amateur stuff is better than paid stuff. CNET. How long were you involved before you resigned? Young. Not long. A few weeks. It wasn't long. However, one of the things that happened is that somehow I got subscribed to that list under another name and the messages kept coming in. I got to keep reading what they were saying about me after they booted me off. The messages kept coming in, so I published those too. 
CNET. Did they criticize you for, well, leaking about WikiLeaks? Young, they certainly did. They accused me of being an old fart and jealous. And all these things that come up that typically happen when someone doesn't like you. That's okay. I know you would never do that, and journalists never do that, but ordinary people do this all the time. CNET, because journalism is a noble profession and all its guise is young. That's right, and there's no backbiting there. By the way, I think that the two of them are speaking tongue-in-cheek here. They should be. CNET, over the years you've been running crypto. You've had some encounters with federal agencies. What visits did you have, and what were the agents concerned about? Young, they were most concerned that we published lists, the names of spies. That was the first issue that brought us to their attention. There was a request, so we were told, from one of the British intelligence people to have that list removed. CNET. And did you remove it? Young. No. And not only that, but the FBI was always very polite. They said, you've done nothing illegal and we're not pursuing a criminal investigation. These are just courtesies we're offering other governments. We had one with the Brits and one with the Japanese that brought them to our door. CNET. You had no interaction with, say, Homeland Security? Young. The other was when we started our eyeball series of publishing photos. That brought one visit and one phone call. But again, they were polite and said there's nothing illegal about this. By the way, contrast this with what Julian Assange is saying about the the, uh, tactics uh, that uh, allegedly he's been subjected to. Continuing, they never used a negative term. They just said the issue has been raised with us. And, by the way, I did a Freedom of Information Act trying to get records of these visits, but I could never find anything. I did get business cards, though, and I asked for ID. They were very polite and gave me business cards, and I published all that. They asked me not to publish their names, but what the hell, Declan, what else do I have to go with? CNET. So if you've been publishing sensitive government information for so long, why have you not had the same encounters that WikiLeaks has had? Young. I don't think they've had any encounters. That's bogus, but that's okay. I know a lot of people who talk about how the government's after them. It's a fairly well-worn path. You know it from your own field. It remains to be seen whether any of this stuff holds up or not. One of the tests is, and we're going to talk about this more, unless you go to jail, it's all bogus. When I go to jail, you'll say he actually did it, finally. He came up with something that offended someone. So far, that hasn't happened. No indictments or anything. These polite visits are the closest I've come. Professionals are going to have nothing to do with WikiLeaks, as you probably know if you check around. People who know security will not have anything to do with WikiLeaks, but the public will. CNET. WikiLeaks pledges to maintain the confidentiality of sources and stress that in the presentation over the weekend. Do you offer contributors the same guarantee? Young. No, that's just a pitch. You cannot provide any security over the Internet, much less any other form of communication. We actually post periodically warnings not to trust our site. Don't believe us. We offer no protection. You're strictly on your own. We also say don't trust anyone who offers you protection, whether it's the U.S. government or anybody else. That's just a story they put out. It's repeated to people who are a little nervous. They think they can always find someone to protect them. No, you can't. You've got to protect yourself. You know where I learned that from? From the cyberpunks. So WikiLeaks cannot protect people. It's so leaky, it's unbelievable how leaky it is as far as security goes. But they do have a lot of smoke blowing on their site, page after page after page, about how they're going to protect you. And I say, uh uh-oh, that's over-promising. The very over-promising is an indication that it doesn't work. And we know that from watching the field of intelligence and how governments operate. When they over-promise, you know they're hiding something. People who are really trustworthy do not go around broadcasting how trustworthy I am. CNET, it sounds like you've become more critical of WikiLeaks over time. Young, it's not just them. It's also that they're behaving like untrustworthy organizations. So, yes, if the shoe fits, fine. I don't want to limit this to WikiLeaks, but, yes, they're acting like a cult, parenthetically. Bear in mind the Anne Hamilton Byrne cult, which I believe Julian Assange was deeply involved with. He certainly was tangential to it. I think uh, there's far more to it than that. Continuing, they're acting, this is John Young talking about WikiLeaks. This is from one of WikiLeaks' founding members. They're acting like a religion. They're acting like a government. They're acting like a bunch of spies. 
They're hiding their identity. They don't account for the money. They promise all sorts of good things. They seldom let you know what they're really up to. They have rituals and all sorts of wonderful stuff, so I admire them for their showmanship and their entertainment value. But I certainly would not trust them with information if it had any value or if it put me at risk or anyone that I cared about at risk. Nevertheless, it's a fascinating, a fascinating development that's come along to monetize this kind of thing. That's what they're up to. You start with free samples. CNET, you've been trying to follow some of WikiLeaks' money flows. You've contacted the German charity and posted their response. They said they're going to have some information to you perhaps in early August. Does that make you feel any better about the money trail? Young, no. To clarify, you're going to publish it on their website. They said you could mirror it or point to it, unquote. So it's not just for, so it's not just for me, but it's only a tiny sliver of what WikiLeaks claims it's raised, whether WikiLeaks has raised a million dollars as they've claimed, or whether they're trying to prime the pump, I don't know. The Wow Holland charity has only handled a very tiny amount of this, and they've said that. We know nothing about the rest, unquote. I notice that WikiLeaks is touting the revelation that's going to come, but it doesn't fit the claim that WikiLeaks is making about how much it's raised. There's nothing wrong with that. People exaggerate all the time for effect. So back to why I admire WikiLeaks, they've got chutzpah, unquote. Skipping down. There was suspicion from day one that this was an entrapment run by someone unknown to suck a number of people into a trap. So we actually don't know. But it's certainly a standard counterintelligence technique, and they're usually pretty elaborate and pretty carefully run. They'll even prosecute people as part of the cover story. That actually was talked about at Sunday's panel. They'll try to conceal who was informing and betraying others by pretending to prosecute them. And uh, then, uh, and on Cryptome.org, some of the emails that Julian Assange had uh, basically sent around, and because John Young, now one of the organization's critics, is, was originally one of its founders, he has the following. And here is a Julian Assange email. One, WikiLeaks was founded by Chinese dissidents, mathematicians, and startup company technologists from the United States, Taiwan, the epicenter, by the way, of the Asian People's Anti-Communist League, part of the old Wackel Network, Europe, Australia, and South Africa. So again, note, WikiLeaks was founded by Chinese dissidents, mathematicians, and startup company technologists from the U.S., Taiwan, Europe, Australia, and South Africa. Our advi- Here's another thing, and this from an actual leaked email from Julian Assange. Our advisory board, which is still forming, includes representatives from expatriate Russian and Tibetan refugee communities, reporters, a former U.S. intelligence analyst, and cryptographer. So notice uh, basically who the people are behind this. Representatives from expatriate Russian and Tibetan refugee communities. That's the old uh, Wackle Network, the old UNPO Network. And we've dealt with the uh, Tibetan situation at great length and for the records 547 and 548. And note that it was founded by Chinese dissidents, mathematicians, and startup company technologists from the U.S., Taiwan, Europe, Australia, and ta-da. South Africa, that bastion of human freedom and dignity. Uh, One wonders, uh, was that apartheid or uh, before that? So uh, a fascinating bit of information here uh, from the the horse's mouth or perhaps some other uh, portion of that animal's anatomy. Uh, Still another one, another uh, email that was leaked by uh, John Young. And this is from Julian J. And, and he's, what he's talking here is about how they're basically going to enlist the support and of uh, organizations like CIA and then turn on them. Huh, what? What hubris, boy? <laughs> that is real hubris. Or else is it just a feint? Uh, and this, again, more from uh, Julian Assange. John, we are going to F them all. I'm attenuating that, obviously, for FCC purposes. Chinese mostly, but not entirely a feint. Invention abounds. Lies Twists and distorts everywhere are needed for protection. Hackers monitor Chinese and other intel as they burrow into their targets. When they pull, so do we. Inexhaustible supply of material. Nearly nearly 100,000 documents and emails a day. We're going to crack the world open and let it flower into something new. If fleecing the CIA will assist us, then fleece we will. We have pullbacks from NED, CFR, Freedom House, and other CIA teats. 
We have all of pre-2005 Afghanistan, almost all of India fed, half a dozen foreign ministries, dozens of political parties and consulates, World Bank, APEC, UN sanctions, trade, UN sections, trade groups, Tibet and Fulan Dafa associations, and Russian fishing mafia who pull data everywhere. We're drowning. We don't even know a tenth of what we have or who it belongs to. We stop storing it at 1TB. And we're going to find out uh, at the end of this broadcast just uh, whose auspices uh, Pir- uh, 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 WikiLeaks is now enjoying. Because bear in mind all that information, bear in mind them leaking the Social Security numbers of active-duty American personnel. Uh, we're going to see basically who is standing astride the WikiLeaks network at the moment, under whose auspices they're operating. You think about whether you want them to have this kind of information. Now, uh, one of the things that we've spoken about is the fact that WikiLeaks, and we talked about this in uh, the, at the conclusion of For the Record 724, and it's touched on in that interview with John Young, and that is the fact that WikiLeaks is now obtaining money under the auspices of the Wow Holland Foundation. This is a nonprofit organization in Germany named for an iconic German hacker named Wow Holland. We're going to talk about that now. Uh, what I'm going to do in the description for the program, because I don't think we're going to have time to really talk about it, the Wow Holland Foundation grew out of something called the Chaos Computer Club in the 1980s. This was a bunch of German hackers, not to be confused by an American organization with a similar name. And uh, among the things that the Chaos Computer Club did was to hack into U.S. national security and NATO computers, as well as other things, on behalf of the old KGB, which then rewarded them with drugs and uh, apparently money. Uh, I would note that uh, two of the hackers that did this, one was a guy named, uh, nicknamed Tron or Boris Florisic, I may be mispronouncing his last name. He was found hanged in a park in Germany, but his feet were still on the ground. It was an alleged suicide. Another one of those hackers who uh, hacked on behalf of the KGB was found burned alive. He had been doused with gasoline and torched. And Wow Holland himself died at the ripe old age of 49 of a stroke. So uh, that may have been the payback for uh, doing that. The point being here that from the get-go, the Chaos Computer Club appears to have had some encounters with intelligence agencies. I sure, I sure wouldn't hack NATO or U.S. national security computers on behalf of KGB. They found out where that sort of thing gets you, I suspect. But one of the things that's worth noting is a, a dynamic about the world of hacking. Uh, when hackers get busted, they frequently are turned to being operatives on behalf of the governments uh, against whom they had been infracting. That's kind of awkward phraseology, but what the heck. Uh, Now, an indication... Uh, that that may have happened with the Wow Holland Foundation. They were hacking the German postal system. They were hacking phone cards, all sorts of encryption things that could have done all sorts of damage. But uh, we're going to take a look at uh, this particular article, and the full URL from this uh, will be in the description for the program. On July 30th of 2001, there's the following article about the Wow Holland Foundation. And uh, this is by Boris Grondahl. This is from lists.jam.com. And uh, talking about Wow Holland, Wow Holland taught his fellow CCCers never to hack for profit, to always be open about what they were up to, and to fight for an open information society. He was deeply embarrassed when some CCCers sold their discoveries from within the U.S. military computer network to the KGB. This incident and the subsequent discussions in the club brought the next generation to the CCC's helm. So notice that KGB hack basically resulted in a change of leadership. While Holland sure got changed, again, he died at the age of 49 of a uh, stroke. But now... Who is the new CCC, a.k.a., you know, slash Wow Holland Foundation? While the new leadership has a less strict, moralistic, more postmodern sense of hacking, it remains too true to the CCC's political objectives. Holland became the club's honorary president, yeah, until he died at the age of 49. Under his stewardship, the CCC gained considerable status in German politics, with its speakers invited by the parliament, telecoms firms, banks, and even the Secret Service. The Secret Service, of course, is the BND, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, the the Federal German Intelligence Service, and the final incarnation of the old Reinhard Galen Nazi Eastern Front spy outfit. And behind the scenes, it retains all of its old character. 
Now, again, uh, note that the uh, that th- those intrepid hackers are now basically the the available evidence suggests that uh, the CCC slash Wow Holland Foundation has basically been turned, and among the people to whom they proffer their services are the BND, the German Intelligence Service. Now, back to Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks. He himself was or the main founder, of course, along with the Russian and Tibetan expatriates and all those other people we were looking at. Uh, Julian Assange himself was a hacker. He got busted, but he got a wrist slap, which suggests very strongly that he himself may have been one of these turned hackers, so to speak. From the Christian Science Monitor of July 26th of 2010, a Scott Bland article, Julian Assange, the hacker who created WikiLeaks, it reads in part, programming quickly became hacking once Assange got an internet connection and soon he was accessing government networks and bank mainframes. He was arrested in 1991 and charged with more than 30 criminal counts related to his hacking. Facing as many as 10 years in prison, Assange struck a plea deal. During sentencing, the judge ruled that Assange only had to pay a fine. Assange's hacks were not malicious. They were the harmless result of, quote, inquisitive intelligence, unquote, said the judge. Though Assange's most recent well-known projects have had an anti-war bent, the recent Afghan war leaks, the infamous collateral murder, unquote, video of a U.S. helicopter crew gunning down a group that included two Reuters journalists in Iraq, his site does not appear to have an obvious ideology beyond exposing secrets, something a lot of so-called progressives have forgotten about uh, WikiLeaks, and it's it's, uh, mentioned in this last uh, paragraph. In other projects, Assange published a trove of text messages sent in the U.S. on September 11, 2001, and emails from the University of East Anglia's Climate Research Unit, which led many to believe that scientists were suppressing anti-global warming research and results. The point being in that last paragraph that it was WikiLeaks that was a source, the source for all of those documents that became uh, the focal point of a huge uh, brouhaha about whether or not uh, scientists were conspiring to falsify evidence of global warming. And you know, everybody from uh, uh, Gauleiter Limbaugh to Gauleiter Beck to the others were uh, touting that one. Well, that comes from WikiLeaks. And uh, I would note, too, that the fact that Julian Assange got this wrist slap uh, would indicate that very possibly Julian Assange was turned by the Australian authorities. Now, inside, in the first part of this uh, this series, really, uh, in For the Record 724, we took a look at Julian Assange's connections to the Sonicetan and Park Association. Uh, that gives every evidence of being a very powerful cult, perhaps some sort of British-slash-Australian intelligence manifestation of MK Ultra, but it certainly appears to be connected to intelligence, mind control. It was engaged in some serious criminal activity and obviously a very formidable organization and not one to be trifled with. Uh, Many years of Julian Assange's early life were devoted to attempting to allegedly flee this cult, uh, except he has the same kind of hair that is characteristic of people who belong to this cult. And this cult has some connections to Australian intelligence, uh, apparent connections to Australian intelligence. We will talk about that inside two of this broadcast. Uh, this program will highlight why people should use the SpitfireList.com website, www.spitfirelist.com, the best source for information about this subject material, so please use it. Uh, we've been talking about the WikiLeaks network, and uh, specifically, we've been following up on information that we began accessing in For the Record 724, Wiki of the Damned, and uh, it's liberation uh, psychology notwithstanding, the the available evidence suggests very strongly that WikiLeaks is an intelligence operation of some kind. There may very well be more than one intelligence agency involved, but the evidence suggests that its overall orientation is one of reaction, if not outright fascism, and although it's Uh, been hostile to uh, American military, which leads some people to think this is some sort of progressive organization. I think as we get into side two, uh, the true nature of WikiLeaks is going to become uh, only 
too evident. Uh, obviously, there are many intelligence connections to this particular network, and we're going to plunge right in. We concluded side one by taking a look at how Julian Assange himself, a criminal hacker, got a wrist slap by Australian authorities. That would suggest that some sort of deal was cut. And indeed, uh, I've noted that the cult, which I believe Julian Assange was deeply involved with, he maintains his connections were tangential. I think the evidence argues in the other direction. But the family cult, not to be confused with a right-wing Christian organization or an organization that was publicized uh, by uh, Joaquin Phoenix, uh, the actor, uh, this organization appears to be an intelligence front of some kind, a deadly mind control cult with very powerful links. At one point, they were running their own uh, psychiatric hospital. People were being experimented on there, and they appear to be implementing their adherence with a deep, deep form of mind control. And as we looked at in For the Record 724, at one point, uh, one of the people who was being cared for by the group, the aunties in this group of Anne Hamilton Byrne, were being trained as nurses, which is really interesting because nurses could do all kinds of things, from killing people who were in their care to obtaining tissue samples, medical information, which would be of tremendous use in a political context. So having a lot of nurses around, the quote, aunties, unquote, of this cult, would itself be very, very interesting, particularly in light of the fact that that cult almost certainly certainly has intelligence links. And at one point, they were caring, these, quote, aunties, unquote, for caring for the British, uh, for the Australian parliament, parliamentary member, parliamentary, basically the British minister, who was in charge of overseeing the Australian intelligence service. So uh, that makes the following claim, the fact that Julian Assange, a criminal hacker, got off awfully light, that makes uh, the following very, very interesting indeed. This is an article from msnbc.com, and it's about the reopening of sexual criminal charges into Julian Assange in Sweden. More about the Swedish connection in just a minute. Uh, This is a Reuters story, and it reads in part, A top Swedish prosecutor said on Wednesday she was reopening an investigation into rape allegations against Julian Assange, the founder of whistleblowing website WikiLeaks. Assange has denied the charges, which a lower official had withdrawn two weeks ago, and said he had been warned by Australian intelligence that he could face a campaign to discredit him after leaking the documents. Again, bearing in mind uh, the links of the Anne Hamilton Byrne cult to Australian intelligence described earlier. And uh, again, as we looked at in For the Record 724, uh, Julian Assange claims he spent several years of his life fleeing from this cult because his mother had gotten involved with a member of it, had uh, birthed a child by this fellow, and uh, there was a custody struggle that in, uh, basically resulted in this group, uh, resulted rather in Julian and his mother fleeing for a period of many years. And interestingly, Julian says the cult always found a way of locating them. Well, I wonder if that might have been because Julian was actually part of that cult. Then, interestingly enough, Uh, Following another brutal custody struggle in which Julian Assange was fighting for custody of his own daughter, uh, then, according to Julian's mother, his hair turned white as a result of the trauma. That peculiar platinum blonde slash white color of the hair is characteristic of members of this cult who have their hair dyed. Again, we looked at that in For the Record 724. Uh, I suspect very strongly that Julian Assange is strongly linked to that cult and that the accounts of his fleeing the cult and also the interesting account of his hair turning white after a brutal custody struggle are a modified limited hangout meant to sanitize him if and when his links to the cult come out. Again, look at the pictures that are in the written description for For the Record 724. It's quite striking, uh, the, the platinum blonde, dyed blonde hair of the members of this cult. Now, going back to this MSNBC slash Reuters story, uh, skipping down, Director of Public Prosecutions Marianne Nye said she decided to reopen the investigation against Assange after further review of the case. Quote, there is reason to believe that a crime has been committed. Considering information available at present, my judgment is that the classification of the crime is rape, unquote, Nye said in a statement on the Prosecution Authority's website. 
More investigations are necessary before a final decision can be made, she added. She also said a preliminary investigation into charges of molestation would be expanded to sexual coercion and sexual molestation. Uh, note the, the expanding of the charges to sexual coercion and sexual molestation. Again, I have more questions and answers about the criminal charges against Julian Assange. But one of the things I find very, very interesting is that uh, the Swedish landing place, so to speak, for uh, WikiLeaks has some very, very interesting links indeed. Uh, the following is from the local, that's a blog spot for Sweden. This is from April 9th of 2010, or this spring. Police powerless to close pedophile forums. Despite a new law designed to tackle grooming of young people by suspected pedophiles on Internet websites, police are unable to act against those hosting chat forums, contact sites, and advice pages. Quote, the so-called grooming law, which came into force last July, forbids sexually motivated contact with children over the Internet. But the adult has to take some sort of initiative in that contact for it to be an offense to arrange a date by a train ticket or such like, unquote, said Jonas Person of the Swedish police to the local on Friday. In the six months after the law was adopted, the police received only 100 reports, despite the fact that more than half of Swedish girls aged 15 to 17 claimed to have been subjected to grooming attempts by adults over the Internet before reaching the age of 15, according to a National Council for Crime Prevention report from 2007. The law does not allow for the closure of websites for the prosecution of those behind them. Jonas Person explained why, quote, I don't think a tightening of the legislation is desirable. It would come dangerously close to encroaching on freedom of expression legislation, unquote, he said. Legal obligations for those behind websites visited by suspected pedophiles and would-be groomers extend only to the removal of pictures and films which feature minors or the publication of personal information. The local has received information that a man resident in Stockholm is alleged to be behind a chat forum serving as a contact point for pedophiles and hosted by PRQ, a Swedish web hosting firm run by Pirate Bay co-founders Gottfried Svarholm Varg and Friedrich Neige, and also noted for hosting the WikiLeaks whistleblower website. Anti-pedophilia activists claim to have made attempts to persuade PRQ to close the man's website, but to no avail. So note that this pedophile website is basically being hosted by PRQ, a web hosting firm run by Pirate Bay co-founders Gottfried Svartom Varg and Friedrich Neige, and they're hosting this pedophile chat forum as well as WikiLeaks. Now, this brings us to a very interesting link indeed. Uh, Pirate Bay is a music downloading website. And uh, as we looked at in uh, a miscellaneous news and supplemental article, and also in For the Record 707, the main man behind Pirate Bay, the main financier, is a Swedish Nazi named Carl Lundström, who, as we're going to see, is also uh, a fellow financing candidate for the Swedish equivalent of the BNP, the Sweden Democrats, who for the first time were seated in Parliament in a recent Swedish election, and who are being seen as possible kingmakers in the Swedish parliamentary system. This is from the British Register of February 26th of 2009. It reads in part, it's titled, uh, it's about uh, Carl Lundström, the uh, Pirate Bay neo-Nazi patron. The trial of the Pirate Bay operators in Sweden has generated huge amounts of media coverage, but one of the most interesting things about Pirate Bay hasn't gotten a mention. In his daily dispatches for Wired, court correspondent Oscar Schwartz swoons over the boyish charm of likable and winning, unquote, Pirate Bay PR guy Peter Sund, S-U-N-D-E. But there seems to be something about Pirate Bay that no one wants you to read. It's debt to one of the most notorious fascists in Europe. 
Regular readers will already know a little about Carl Lundstrom's background, but as Andrew Brown, author of the autobiographical Fishing in Utopia, points out, no English-language coverage of the trial has mentioned this. Thanks to Brown's blog, we know a little more about Lundstrom. For example, Lundstrom was linked to a gang of skinheads that attacked Latin American tourists in Stockholm in the mid-1980s. Over the years, Lundstrom has switched his support from Keep Sweden Swedish to the far-right headbangers party New Democracy, but was thrown out for being too right-wing. He's currently bankrolling a 100 candidates for the Swedish equivalent of the BNP, that are the Sweden Democrats, more about them later. Lundström is alleged to own 40% of the Pirate Bay, the largest share, and note this, gave its servers and bandwidth to get going. And these are the servers currently hosting WikiLeaks and also the Swedish pedophile forum. I wonder if there may be a link between the Swedish pedophile forum, WikiLeaks presence on that server, and also the Australian intelligence uh, cult that we were looking at. One of the things that we looked at in 724 was the fact that the poor kids who grow up in this cult are subjected to brutal sexual molestation and uh, just some really hard, basically forms of torture being uh undergoing sensory deprivation uh, and then being stabbed and sexually molested while under the effects of LSD. It's pretty horrible stuff. Sexual molestation can be used as an element of mind control, the ritual mind control, uh, and uh, one should always, basically should, ritual molestation, I should say, can be used as an element of mind control. We've taken a look at that in uh, some of the AFA programs about mind control, and one should note that uh, the techniques practiced by that Australian cult uh, are basically involve molestation. And note uh, the charges against Julian Assange. Is he involved in some way with some of these networks in Sweden? Certainly, the Pirate Bay network is financed in considerable measure by one of Europe's most notorious fascists, the aforementioned Carl Lundström. This is not the only link between Pirate Bay and WikiLeaks. And one of the interesting things about uh, Pirate Bay, too, is that Pirate Bay has its own political party called the Pirate Party. It has branches in Sweden, of course, more about that in a minute, and it has a branch in Germany where the Wow Holland Foundation is. That's the nonprofit <laughs> that is uh, handling donations for WikiLeaks and that has links to, among other institutions, apparently the BND, the German Intelligence Service. The following is more. This is about the German branch or the German manifestation of the local blog. Uh, the Pirate Party in Germany actually had a seated member in the German parliament. That was a guy named Jörg Taus. However, he was ousted after he was convicted of possessing child pornography. This from the local again. Taus leaves Pirate, Bay, Pirate Party after child pornography conviction. Former parliamentarian Jörg Taus, the most prominent member of the German Pirate Party, has resigned from the party following his conviction for possessing child pornography last week. Two days after the Karlsruhe District Court handed the 56-year-old a 15-month suspended sentence, Taus said on Sunday that he would leave the party to avoid damaging its reputation, saying his presence would be, quote, counterproductive, unquote. And, uh, so that is it, uh, a very, very interesting thing indeed. At one point, uh, Taos was a member of the left Social Democratic Party, uh, but that changed. He then became part of the Pirate Party. That is an international political party associated with Pirate Bay. And the Pirate Party has sponsored WikiLeaks' presence in Sweden. Uh, this is for, uh, the full, your full uh, URL for this particular posting will be in the description for, for the record, 725. And uh, this is uh, talking about the underground nuclear bunker that now hosts WikiLeaks in Sweden, courtesy of the Swedish Pirate Party. And uh, the following is, uh, again, the URL for this will be available in the, the description for, for the record, 75. One of the world's most controversial websites now has one of the world's coolest data centers. Uh, 
Andy Greenberg at Forbes has picked up on a Norwegian report that WikiLeaks servers are now hosted in Sweden's Pionen Data Center, housed inside a Cold War-era underground nuclear bunker. 30 meters below Stockholm, it reportedly has a single entrance with half-meter thick metal doors. The move has been initiated by the Swedish Pirate Party, who began looking after WikiLeaks hosting this month. Quote, we have long admired WikiLeaks, the Pirate Party's Rick Falkvinge told Norway's VG, claiming that as his party is hosting WikiLeaks, an attack on WikiLeaks is also regarded as an attack on a political party. Gossip blog Gawker has today launched, and this is another uh, interesting po- aspect of this post, Gossip blog Gawker Gossip blog Gawker has today launched WikileaksLeaks.org in an attempt to rake up stories about the little discussed internal operations at the organization. Among the stories it's looking for are documents relating to Julian Assange's Swedish sexual molestation case. So note that the Swedish Pirate Party is hosting WikiLeaks. Their servers are the PRQ Pirate Bay servers, and the financier of that is Carl Lundstrom, who is also the leading financier of candidates by the Sweden Democrats. The Swedish, they would probably call themselves nationalist or far right. It's actually the Swedish Fascist Party, or one of them. And uh, note they're financed by Carl Lundstrom. One of the things that we looked at in connection with Carl Lundstrom, this in For the Record 707, that is the fact that he got his wealth from selling the family food business to the uh, Sandoz Corporation. Sandoz, of course, is the best known as the maker of LSD. It's part of the old IG Farben complex, uh, the IG Farben chemical cartel. It was the backbone of the Third Reich and also the foundation of the post-war underground Reich. And believe me, this I know how crazy this will sound to newer listeners. What is he talking about? Check the website, check the book Martin Borman, Nazi in Exile by Paul Manning, a protege and colleague of Edward R. Murrow's, and that'll help to flesh out your understanding in that particular regard. Uh, one of the things we noted in our discussions in For the Record 724 is that according to Sarah Moore, the the uh, one of the apostate members of the Anne Hamilton Byrne cult, LSD was provided free to that cult by Sandoz. So What is the real affiliation of that cult? Is it Underground Reich? Is it some element of British intelligence? Both. Who is penetrating who? Is it Underground Reich penetrating British intelligence? Is it the other way around? Who knows? But uh, note that Carl Lundstrom sold his business to his family's, uh, basically, uh, wafer business to Sandoz. That gave him the money to begin financing Swedish fascism, which he is doing. And note that the Swedish pedophile forum is on the PRQ servers that uh, also uh, are provided by Pirate Bay and that also are hosting WikiLeaks. And note that uh, WikiLeaks is being sponsored by the Pirate Party. That is an outgrowth of Pirate Bay financed by Carl Lundstrom. One of the interesting things about this And as we noted in uh, For the Record 707, as well as a miscellaneous post in the News and Supplemental section, uh, one of the interesting things about Swedish fascism is that it is being featured in a very prominent way on the world's artistic stage at this moment. Uh, Specifically, a series of Swedish films have been made out of the Millennium Trilogy of Stig Larsson, the late Stig Larsson, whose death on the anniversary of Die Kristallnacht is something we looked at in For the Record 707 and also in that miscellaneous post. Uh, Stig Larsson's novels, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, and The Girl Who uh, Kicked the Hornet's Nest, are subsumed under the Millennium Trilogy. In Sweden, they're marketed under the name of Men Who Hate Women. And one of the interesting things about this, as noted in the a Christopher Hitchens article about Stig Larsson and his death, is from uh, Vanity Fair, uh, a section of the Swedish uh, of the Christ- Christopher Hitchens article about Stig Larsson reads as follows. I also know someone with excellent contacts in the Swedish police and security world who assures me that everything described in the Millennium novels actually took place 
And apparently, Larson planned to write as many as ten in all, so you can see how many people here could think he might not have died but have been stopped, unquote. In For the Record 707, we also looked at the fact that Stig Larsson uh, also, the, the Nazis in Sweden have strong links to the Swedish intelligence service. They would certainly know about how to precipitate a uh, an apparent heart attack. One of the, the interesting things about uh, the, again, the Millennium novels, they are enjoying huge distribution, huge popularity in the United States, are, as are the films. There's also going to be a Hollywood a series of Hollywood films made out of the same movies, but I would encourage people to go see the various films coming out about the Stig Larsson novels, based from or de- derived from the Stig Larsson novels, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, The Girl Who Played with Fire, and The Girl Who, trick- who Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Read the books, see the movies, because what that is is real. That is reality portrayed as fiction to protect the guilty or perhaps to protect the authors from uh, retribution. In Stig Larsson's case, it appears not to have been successful. Again, quoting, though, from the Christopher Hitchens piece about Stig Larsson, In the Larsson universe, the nasty trolls and and hulking ogres are bent Swedish capitalists, cold-faced Baltic sex traffickers, blue-eyed Viking Aryan Nazis, and other Nordic riffraff who might have had their reasons to whack him. Note what he says, bent Swedish capitalists, cold-faced Baltic sex traffickers, and blue-eyed Viking Aryan Nazis, and other Nordic riffraff who might have had their reasons to whack him. His best excuse for his own prurience is that these serial killers and torture fanciers are practicing a form of capitalism and that their racket is protected by a pornographic alliance with a form of fascism, its lower ranks made up of hideous bikers and meth runners. This is not just sex or crime, it's politics. Yes, indeed. You note another John Young observation, John Young, one of the founders of WikiLeaks and a critic of it, This uh, from an interview conducted with him by the BBC. BBC, what do you think about WikiLeaks being based in a country which will protect it from takedown? Cryptome, there is no place where a takedown cannot occur. The distribution system for communication can always be blocked and servers confiscated. Only multiple growing and changing public outlets for prohibited information can offer a chance of avoiding shutdown, demonization, corruption through finance and robbery, and organized, distru- orchestrated distrust. BBC, what do you think about security of websites and communication on the Internet? Cryptome, there is none that is not superficial and illusory. Security and or privacy policy for the Internet and digital, digital communication are not credible. Digital communication should be seen as a spying machine. The Internet is a magnificently appealing means to gather data on its bewitched users for harvesting by governments, commerce, institutions, and individuals, but especially by the providers of Internet services, distribution systems, and equipment. BBC, why are you so paranoid about the Internet, and what do you think, it is, what do you think is possible for its use in providing more public information? Cryptome, skepticism, not paranoia about the Internet and digital communication, is self-protective because their managers and operators are inaccessible to public scrutiny under claims of secrecy. So, again, uh, John Young is very skeptical about the Internet, though not opposed to it, or skeptical about security. Note how skeptical he is that uh, the current country of residence for WikiLeaks, Sweden, is going to protect them. Uh, Of course, there are links between the Swedish fascist milieu and the Swedish intelligence service. Now, note uh, what was in in the article, the Register article about Carl Lundström. He's the main financier of the candidates of the Sweden Democrats. From the BBC of September 20th of this year, Swedish voters react to far-right gains. A far-right anti-immigration party in Sweden has won seats in parliament for the first time, denying the governing center-right coalition an overall majority. The Sweden Democrats won 20 of the 349 seats in the country's assembly in Sunday's general election. Here, voters in Sweden react to the results and debate the significance of the Sweden Democrats' gains. And uh, so note that the Sweden Democrats gained seats in Parliament for the first time under an anti-immigrant platform. Uh, One of the interesting things is is that there are links between the underground Reich and the Muslim Brotherhood Islamists who are in many ways uh, spurring European reaction and the rebirth, uh, reemergence of European fascism at a populist-slash-street level. And uh, yet uh, the... 
Islamist presence, the Islamist presence in Europe, is one of the things that is spurring the growth of parties like the Sweden Democrats. So note, and by the way, in the description of this program, I'm going to note articles that are positing the Sweden Democrats as possible coalition makers in the Swedish parliamentary democratic system. They are bankrolled primarily by Carl Lundström, the Swedish f- fascist financier of Pirate Bay, and that Pirate Bay is the auspices basically under which WikiLeaks is now operating. So when considering the highly sensitive information that WikiLeaks gets, including uh, operational plans by the U.S. military, social security numbers of active duty U.S. military personnel. Uh, Note also the information about pedophiles and sex trafficking. Uh, That also could be of tremendous use to a Nazi political machine, given very, very sensitive information indeed. And note that uh, basically everything that is portrayed in the Stig Larsson's novels is real. And with WikiLeaks, in a sense, we're seeing the merging of uh, the Stig Larsson novels with reality, the reality that they in fact portray. We're going to conclude with the following item. Although WikiLeaks has been regarded with great favor by the so-called progressive sector, note my uh, choice of words, Uh, Note that it was WikiLeaks that uh, was the vehicle for downloading the emails on the East Anglia climate research, and that spurred a huge attack on the credibility of global warming. Uh, Note the following. This uh, is from an article by the L.A. Times. Stephen H. Schneider dies at 65, Stanford expert on climate change by Elaine Wu from July 20th of this year. Stephen H. Schneider, a Stanford University biologist on the vanguard of climate change research for four decades who argued eloquently on human culpability and global warming and willingly threw himself into the political fray to explain and defend the scientific evidence has died. He was 65. Schneider had a heart attack Monday while flying to London from a science meeting in Stockholm, according to Stanford spokesman Dan Stober. Santer and Schneider were among the scientists who served on the international panel that shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with former Vice President Al Gore, who in a statement Monday called Schneider a prolific researcher, an author, and a wonderful communicator whose contributions to the advancement of climate science will be sorely missed, unquote. He, Schneider said he received hundreds of abusive emails from critics, particularly since the Copenhagen Climate Change Summit in December. A few weeks ago, he told the London Guardian newspaper that his name was among those of several climatologists that appeared earlier this year on a death list on a neo-Nazi website. He died of an apparent heart attack flying to London from a science meeting in Stockholm. Might he have gotten a Stig Larsson treatment? Uh, And again, note that it was WikiLeaks that leaked the East Anglia documents. More about this in the description for For the Record 725. However, this concludes side two of For the Record program number 725. Leak this. Wiki Spooks and the World of Stig Larsson. This is being recorded on October 9th of the year 2010. My name's Dave Emery. Thanks for listening.